For those who don't know, John K is the creative mind behind Ren and Stimpy. This Weird Al animation, as well as the animator behind this Tenacious D song. Throughout the man's career, he truly revolutionized TV animation and unfortunately started a trend of gross-out adult animation. Despite all the good he's done for the industry, recent developments show that the man behind the animation has a dark side. And today, we plan on informing people why John K no longer gets work and why he's objectively hated in the industry today. So please sit back, relax, and welcome to my dungeon. This is the top five reasons why John K is hated. Adult Party Cartoons Ren and Stimpy was an absolute success as we previously mentioned, even without the help of show creator John Kerfuskel, John Kirk, John K. He only worked on the first six episodes before promptly getting his ass fired for being consistently late, and we'll go into that part later. Regardless, this angered him greatly, so when Viacom contacted him in 2002 to resurrect the series for Spike TV, John jumped at the opportunity. When he was instructed this is strictly to be for an adult male audience, it seemed to be a dream come true. John K became the leader of the project, not only directing it, but writing and voicing it as well. They gave him almost full creative control over the project, even allowing him to put together his own team which he filled with some of the previous head storyboarders and animators from the show's previous incarnation, which will only be seen as awful later down on our list. Even keeping that in mind, this could only go badly. Most of the original show's voice cast came to an agreement with John in return. All except for the very obvious lack of Billy West, who said, quote, unquote, this was damaging to his career. And with episodes that feature misogyny, torture, and gratuitous use of disgusting content. And keep in mind, this is coming from the guy who thinks watching horror movies is a great way to pass the night away. And want to watch you spit on your grave? Yeah. I can't really blame Billy West for not wanting to return for this incarnation. Billy also went on to say that he was sure that the show wouldn't last very long, which of course he is correct, as the show didn't even make it past his six episodes, and only three of which were even aired. It seemed like six is John's magic number. The show depicted Ren and Stimpy to be bisexual, with many of the episodes alluding to the idea that both Ren and Stimpy are actually lovers. This alongside the infamous Naked Beast Frenzy episode were all objected to by advertisers, which I can kind of understand why. The latter of which being borderline porn, which would far exceed what they could get away with in syndication. In fact, that episode caused such a stir of advertisers it was pulled from airing, which caused plenty of confusion during scheduling. The episode wound up never being seen on television, showing up only on the complete series DVD, which I remind you was only six episodes. Another controversy stirring is the episode that is very infamous, uh, Ren Seeks Help. Before we continue with this one, I feel like this little bit of information is important to share. John himself is a sexually charged, very hands-on creator. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But he also tries to put a little bit of himself into his animations, just like Chris Chan before him. He made some of these episodes as a direct response to losing his um, teenage lover at the time. He even had a little bit of an outline which he gave to his victim and told her what the characters were supposed to represent. Ren, however, was a direct representation of himself, so keep that in mind as we talk about this disturbing tale. We start this gem off by getting the life story of Ren, told entirely in flashbacks during the meeting of its therapist, Mr. Horse. We get disturbed tales featuring animal torture, sadistic imagery. Whether Ren is torturing bugs or frogs, he seems to like it sexually and uses this to escape his abusive Christian parents, 
who I can't really show you much of this, if any, because this is honestly just kind of disgusting. I'm sure you've heard about this episode before, as it's often used in clickbaity, most disturbing cartoon videos. The show was such a hassle to air that it was also blamed for the failure of the Spike TV animation block, but that can also be attributed to the quality of all the programming on the Spike TV animation block, which included things like Stripperella and Gary the Rat. Despite the show's failure, a second season was planned but never produced. But, but hey, just for goofs and gaffs, let's go through the planned episode. Life sucks. Probably the most infamous of the unmade episodes as it's just half an hour of Ren talking about injustices in his life, ranging from mass murders, tortures, and a lot of rather uncomfortable topics, like a children's crusade. This was originally going to be the prequel to Ren Seeks Help because I guess they needed another one of those. Fishing Trip. Not much is known about this episode other than the fact that it's uh, about Ren and Stimpy searching for a fish who likes to say the fuck word a lot. Wilderness Adventure. This one featured one of John's favorite characters, George Licker, taking Ren and Stimpy on a hunting trip. This one's interesting because it was originally set to be on the original Nickelodeon series, but was rejected before airing. The Big Switch. Another episode connected to Ren Seeks Help in which Ren and Stim begin into an argument with Ren about whether or not it's best to be an idiot or a unquote quote psychotic asshole. I don't think we should be surprised that the show was cancelled. We should instead be surprised that it aired to begin with. Kickstarter cans without labels. Kickstarter and other crowdfunding websites like it have been infamous for fraudulent pitches from creative scam artists. Many people use it as a quick buck, promising amazing products, but when it comes time to deliver, they tend to vanish. The proverbial dine and dash. It's at the point where you can't help but be skeptical every time a project shows up and looks vaguely interesting, as there's a great chance it would all be a scam. It was only a matter of time till John Kay decided he wanted to make a Kickstarter. The Kickstarter in question was simple. All he wanted to do was make a cartoon. The cartoon is called Cans Without Labels, and it is precisely that. A cartoon about cans that indeed do not have labels. It's a simple concept. Estimated runtime of about eight minutes, animated in Toon Boom, with a goal of 110,000, which was exceeded by a wide margin, stacking up an impressive outcome of $136,723. Despite this, the animation has yet to be completed in the five years since the conception of the Kickstarter. That's right, John K. promised the cartoon would be finished and distributed way back in 2013. And as of writing and recording this video, it has yet to be released in a complete state. This isn't a surprise, especially given John's history. Whether it be his excessive perfectionism or his ability to just shrug off responsibility like it's dust off his shoulders, there is a good chance you will never ever see this project in its entirety. The project in question was simply eight minutes of a single joke. George Licker purchasing cans without labels and him not knowing what's in them. He opens one and lo and behold, in it was a human face. The rest of the cartoon is him demanding his nephews to eat the face and they of course are hesitant to do so. You can see the unfinished clip on YouTube, but keep in mind it's mostly voice acting piled onto unfinished animation. One of the voice actors in question is voice acting legend Mike Pataki, who plays George Licker. This is the last role Mike played in his death before 2010. This is actually eight years of work, because even though he promised to have it by 2013, he started production of it way back in 2010, and then he started advertising it in 2012. Exactly 3,562 people donated to the project. 1,244 donated a single dollar, they were promised a digital copy of the tune alongside the gratitude of John Kay. 747 donated $30, and they were told they'd get a hand-drawn doodle from John, the man himself. 64 people pledged $100 for a toy designed by John alongside a DVD copy of the short. 34 people paid $300 for an animation still, even though it was animated by Toon Boom, but hey, you also get a DVD. Seven people paid 500, two paid 1,000, three paid 3,000, all each getting a piece of art from the animated short and a DVD. One unlucky individual even donated 10,000 to the project under the premise that John would quote unquote animate his ass or at least a caricature of it into the short. 
They would also get executive producer credit in the film, alongside an actual can without a label, signed by John himself. Oh, and also the DVD. I love how in actual listings, he claims signed by your trusty employee. <laughs> That's gotta be sarcastic. Billy West controversy. Probably the most well-known controversy ever to pertain to John Kay's name was his interactions with this voice actor and at one time work partner Billy West. This story has been told to death and there's plenty of good reasons for that. It is genuinely interesting and its mythical status is cemented by the hard to watch interview done on Howard Stern's show. The full story goes like this. John Kay had hired Billy West to take part of Stimpy for his cartoon, which was coming out for the Nickelodeon Network. It was supposed to be revolutionary for the time, as it was the first animated show to be creator-driven, as opposed to being based on some sort of already pre-existing property. John was hailed at the time for his creative genius behind the show, as he always would have a hands-on approach to voicing, storyboarding, and more importantly, the animating. This would be the downfall of the man as he was a perfectionist going into extreme meticulous detail to smallest of things, stuff that the average viewer wouldn't even see as it would only be on screen for a fraction of a second, sometimes scrapping and reanimating the same scene over and over and over again just to get it done the right way. He was the same when it came to voice acting, making Billy West do the same take over and over and over again. Billy claimed that he had to do the same scream almost a hundred times till his voice was sore, all because it wasn't just, uh, quite right. The problem with this is that the episodes were often late, sometimes by weeks, because of this extreme perfectionism. It's because of this that he was fired after only six episodes. He was swiftly replaced in every aspect with Billy West taking over the role of Wren, which infuriated John to almost no end. John commanded Billy alongside all the animators, storyboards, and everyone else who depended on this for a paycheck to quit, believing that the show could not go on as long as everyone else quit, and they couldn't do the show without John, right? Even though he was known to aggravate and abuse everyone on set, he believed that they would go with them. John defended this by saying that if everybody left, Nickelodeon would have no choice but to continue, and that it was the early 90s during this time when shows were faceless and most people really didn't care who worked on them. Nickelodeon would have more likely than just replaced all of them, They the same way that they replaced John. John would go on to complain about firing or his firing to anyone who would listen, even getting the magazine Wild Cartoon Kingdom to publish an entire magazine about the supposed injustices of Nickelodeon and everybody who he worked with. It's heavily biased and at times factually dubious, depicting everybody except himself in a very harsh light. At the same time, Billy West also had a gig as a reoccurring guest on The Howard Stern Show, Stern being a radio broadcaster for a couple of decades and a cultural icon. Howard would often try and cause dysfunctional situations for his guests and anybody else who he could, trying to embarrass the people for the entertainment of a large group of eager listeners. The man essentially become the Logan Paul of grown-ups. Stern found out about this situation between his buddy and John Kay. So the next thing he did was book John Kay onto the next show for them to have a confrontation live on air. This, uh, d predictably didn't go well, with the interview and things getting predictably awkward and just got worse and worse with Billy looking more and more uncomfortable as it progressed. Howard Stern kept trying to push them into a fight, but both parties didn't really seem into it. All the while, Howard just came across like a extremely unpleasant, unprofessional, I'm struggling to find words for it, I guess douchebag would be one of them. The best moments are when John proclaims that Billy was not allowed to apologize. Say he's allowed sorry to a little bit. He's not allowed to apologize. Do you think he? He proclaims that Billy betrayed him, 
and the point when Howard calls Billy a straight up backstabber. Did you really expect Billy to leave? Uh, yeah. Uh, he did. You did expect Billy to leave. Yeah, well, he told me he was going to. Oh. He did. Oh. <laughs> hey, Billy, you Backstab backstabbing. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> There is also a point when John's assistant tries to shame Billy. I think he's healing. Do you think he's healing? <laughs> Was he really mad at Billy? I want to see them kiss. Though. Was he really mad at Billy, though? <laughs> 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 Will I get fired? <laughs> no, you can be honest. Come on, it's freedom of speech. Uh, from what I hear, I wasn't around when it happened, but from what I hear, it was, uh... He was there at the top of the path, yeah. No kidding. <laughs> Am I right? Most of the interview, John makes really weird claims like Billy sent me a box of red hots only for Billy to call it a joke. He also claimed that he was kicked off the project for making the show too quickly. Another incorrect claim when John said, Billy is telling people that he made Ren and Stimpy. Billy quickly refutes this. Howard Stern keeps trying to create more and more animosity between the two. Give it a listen. It's actually one of the most awkward hours of your life. Billy West never returned to the Howard Stern show. I wonder why. One of the things people tend not to understand is that Billy was a voice actor during a time period where voice actors had no real stake in animation. They were a dime a dozen and often replaced without any thought in studios. If Billy would have left, he would have been replaced. There's no question about it. Everybody was replaceable back then, and also, why should Billy quit his paying gig? All because John dug his own grave. All John wanted to do was take everybody down with him, and it's quite evident to see why. To this day, him and Billy refuse to work together, but they came really close during the production of the infamous adult party cartoons. One long post has since been deleted on Billy West's website where he explains everything that happened, both on and off the set of Red and Stimpy, and how John is extremely controlling even though the post has gone from the site, there are still archives of it like this one. In the post, he goes into meticulous detail about how John would mock him for not doing the show, claiming that the new guy did a much better job at it than Billy ever did, and that John would often tell lies about why Billy wasn't the show, claiming that he wouldn't take a direction. This feud is still going on to this day and never shows any signs of it stopping. However, I do have one thing I would like to mention here. If you happen to see Billy West at any convention for whatever reason, please do not bring this up to him. The guy is absolutely fantastic. I got to meet him one time at Yomacon and he's honestly a pretty cool dude. He seems pretty reserved and from what I understand, Billy West is the type of individual who just wants to sing to fucking die. So with this being set in stone, nailed down, beaten, buried, and dragged out into the sun to rot, let's let this little stink on the internet finally die. It's been two decades, people. Mr. Hanky Thievery. Okay, this is probably going to be a much shorter one, but the fact that it happened is so ludicrously insane, it's worth mentioning. John Kay got into legal trouble with Trey Parker and Matt Stone over Mr. Hanky, the Christmas poo the chipper singing holiday turd that has been a mainstay of the show South Park since the very beginning. Yeah, John Kay went on to claim that this was indeed a ripoff of one of his creations. The creation in question is Nutty, the friendly dump, which was yet another sentient log. He told E! News in 1998 his side of the story, claiming he pitched an idea about a friendly fecal matter years previous to Comedy Central, which they had turned down. He then turned the idea into a character in one of his comics, in which Jimmy, the idiot boyfriend, befriends a talking piece of excrement. The comic was published two months before the episode aired. I got nine messages on my answering machine from people who said South Park took like 10 of your ideas and put them into one episode. So many things in that episode parallel Ren and Stimpy, he complained to anybody who'd listen. He also claimed that his company, Spumco, were planning on perhaps taking legal action against Comedy Central. After a while, Trey and Matt called his claim ridiculous and went on to say they hadn't seen much of Ren and Stippy to begin with. Everything from Wired to Variety were picking up the story, making it a bigger and bigger issue. Keep in mind, this is all over poop. Trey Parker was so annoyed with this controversy that he wound up writing John Kay a letter explaining his entire story. Parker's parents made the story of Mr. Hankey up 20 years previous so that Trey would always remember to flush the toilet, 
or else Mr. Hankey would follow him around. He ended the letter saying, it is my hope that this personal letter will put an end to your attempts to slander me and my poo. This seemed to be the end, but John Kay needed to have the last word. John admitted it all must have been a series of coincidences, but then went on to tell Trey and Matt that they had to publicly claim to be fans of his and Ren and Stimpy. Instead, they both said they weren't fans at all. All this over feces. Harassment allegations. At the time of this writing and producing of this video, this is currently an ongoing story as of now. It is just allegations and accusations. We only know what we've been told, and from what the witnesses report, many of John's co-workers have commented on the inappropriate relationship with uh, the women, which were normally much younger than him. The most prominent of which was Robin Bird, who has recently come forward on her story on John Kay. He had recently started talking to her at the age of 14 online and eventually convinced her to move in with him when she was only 16. She would go on to recall the full story. It was the late 90s. John and her would contact one another through AOL. She would say how after she'd begun to live with him, he would rub her in sexual ways to her underwear. She recalled she first had sex with him as well when she was only 16, and there was a 25 year difference between the two of them. He would often get her drunk as well, like in this photo of him and Robin taken before she was of the legal drinking age. She broke up with him in the year 2000 before they had an on again off again relationship. She left him fully in 2002 and never came back. Robin would go on to say, he ruined a very good bit of my childhood and early adulthood, gave me PTSD and forced me to change careers, putting my life 10 years behind. He is an abuser in the way that he will pull you into a relationship with him and then tell you who to be and what he wants from you. And everybody needs to know about it. John's attorney defended his client by saying, the 1990s were a time of a mental and emotional fragility for John, especially after losing Ren and Stimpy, his most prized creation. For a brief time, 25 years ago, he had a 16 year old girlfriend. Over the years, John struggled with what were eventually diagnosed with mental illnesses in 2008. To that point, for nearly three decades, he had reeled primarily on alcohol and self-medications. He goes on to claim that John has since been a lot better, but since Robin's story's gone viral, lots of the stories are starting to resurface and some very well incriminating comments from his past, namely when he was on the previously mentioned episode of the Howard Stern Show. He'd begun to advertise his comic, talking slightly about one of his characters who's often seen topless or in sexual situations as well as being underage too. Robin wasn't the only woman to come forward. There's also been Catherine Rice, another online sweetheart of his. John would tell both Robin and Kate that he would hire them at his company. When while Robin went to go live with him, he'd have countless conversations with Kate throughout the late 90s, even sending photographs of her like this one. God only knows what he meant by package boy. Unlike Robin, John never actually touched Katie, but he also had his wonderful John K. charm. Like having conversations with her on the phone while he masturbated. Oh, I forgot to mention, he, she started talking to him when she was only 13 years old. Some of the messes say absurdly creepy things. I would suggest looking at them yourself because I'd rather not say I'm rather like right here. He even went to her 15th birthday party. They were seen together in this image. It would confirm this as well as on the Ren and Simi adult party cartoon DVD. John managed to keep these relationships in the public eye for long enough to severely traumatize many of the young women and girls he preyed upon, only receiving media attention as recently as like now, as the allegations finally resurfaced. When she turned 18, he offered Katie a job which she regretted taking. She goes on to claim that he would harass her at work. She left uh, his business when it went out of business. But that wasn't the end for her and John. In 2004, when she started working for Disney, he began to email her once again, begging her to come back to him, even going on to say, and I quote, I'll worship the ground you walk on. 
she reluctantly returned and helped to make adult party cartoon. She'd even be in most of the DVD special features with John. The harassment seemed to grow worse and worse with time. Katie claimed that John was inappropriately exposing himself to her, having no qualms walking completely naked in her presence. Some of the worst appearances when they were working on the Close But No Cigar music video for Weird Al on set, he, com he commented how he wanted to, and I quote, uh, rape her. John's attorney denied any allegations of him walking around naked, and the rape comment was just an off-color joke. Rice, when asked why she didn't just leave, she had this to say. Why didn't you just leave? Well, because this asshole told me when I was 13 that I was special and I had no self-esteem, so I believed it. At the time, she was rejected from art school and didn't have many prospects. With John, she had a stable income, a home. She felt like she had no choice and an obligation to stay with him. However, the straw that broke the camel's back was in 2007 when she found child pornography on his computer. Katie even went on to say that some were as young as 10 years old in the collection. Another one of his ex-girlfriends who in the BuzzFeed interview confirmed that she had seen this collection. She wished to remain anonymous. According to sources in the BuzzFeed article, former co-workers of Robin and John on several occasions show them nude sexually explicit photos of Robin or would leave them lying around in the office to be discovered. He also had a book of hundreds of screen grabs from a video he sent to him at a age 13. Katie and Robin have since come to the police of this information alongside of evidence as transcripts of their internal chats. They are informed that the statutes of limitations has made persecuting John for these would be impossible. But when they first brought this to the police attention in 2017, it sparked the investigation for child pornography. The police, however, has found nothing. So they thought they'd go for the next big thing and that would be to tell, you know, media so John couldn't do this again. Many comments have since come out and passed and breathed new life, one of which was the DeviantArt user Fanook, who in 2011 made a comment about working with John in the early 2000s, even making a uh, quote about Robin. Another comment that has gained some interest is from B. Copland, who posted a Christmas card sent to her by John in 1992 when she was only 12. As time goes on, more and more stuff is coming to light, so consider this an open ending. Many companies, including Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, has disavowed him, and as the days go on, more and more doing the same. What will happen to John K? Honestly, I don't know. All I hope is, is that he stays away from kids and makes an effort to get some actual fucking help, and not from an actual horse. I mean actual help. Before I also conclude this segment, I would like you guys to leave the secondary creators of Ren and Stimpy alone. These people on screen now are actually some fairly good, decent people, and I really would hope that you wouldn't take them out to dry. They're amazing, that you had no idea about this, and a lot of the animators, including people like Billy West, had nothing to do with the sexual allegations towards Robin. So when you leave this video, please don't fucking tweet them. That'd be fucking great.